Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Conversation Over Coffee. I promise you that I will bring you the best from the best of the femdom scene and not only. So the lady that I'm having for now, um, this episode, uh, it's a woman that I admire so, so much that um, everyone should look up to and I'm pretty sure you will understand when you will find out who it's about. So, it's a privilege to have, um, to be at the House of Sin at the moment to visit and to have Ava von Medicin next to me and um, Thank you very much, Ava, for accepting this. Oh, no. uh, so it's a pleasure to talk to you, finally. <laughs> <laughs> finally. It, yeah. it took us some, some time, but um, I'm so happy that you are here and you accepted. And um, I want to show that it's a privilege both for me and I'm pretty sure for the viewers also to get to know you a little bit more. Um, because I know you for some time already uh, and I'm following you since even more time and um, I know that there's so much more from what we can see on social media and on on the internet in, in general. So once again, um, thank you. And uh, I will want to, to start with one simple basic question. Who is behind the image? Behind the image? I guess um, there is really no one behind the image other than myself. I went out very from the very beginning thinking that there had to be a different persona behind the image of who I am today. Mm -hmm. But in fact, when I was on this journey, I discovered there is no segregated persona right. behind that. So it is very much me. I'm not influenced by anyone i don't look at anyone and say oh, i want to be that person it's always come from my own self so um so yeah, yeah so that's a sort of um quite a quick answered question mm -hmm. but it is basically i have always wanted to be my own self and be the individual not kind of follow a pattern or persona of something other than myself and who are you who are who am i um okay so from if i can i will open quite i will be quite open in who i am i, I, I would appreciate I that and everyone so i am an oldest daughter of eight eight siblings so i'm the oldest of eight children so my parents has I, i'm the oldest daughter so from a very young age i had a lot of responsibility for my younger siblings it was a, a household where my mother was very much at home with us um, but as a daughter um, I got incorporated with helping my mother with my siblings and stuff so at a very young age I learned to be responsible um, and made responsible to be fair possibly a, um, someone would say that it's a responsibility that I shouldn't have had mm -hmm. as a child um, but I guess that's made me who I am right. today because I have made myself responsible for a lot of things what I probably shouldn't have been but it's it's made the characteristics of someone who's strong and uh, yeah so so I'm yeah I'm an oldest child of eight um, possibly thinking that I really had not a lot of options in life and it was very from an uh, a household where it was basically um, that mindset of oh you'll find a good husband you'll work you'll provide your like children traditional and, yeah it was a traditional that. family household mm -hmm. so that was kind of like the mindset of uh, my parents and um, then my mum was diagnosed with cancer and I got married very very young uh, because I felt that it was the thing to do to provide that lasting thing mm -hmm. that my mother had to see, see at least one of her children. You felt the responsibility. Of so it was a responsibility mm -hmm. again. So it's a it's a deeply set sort of um, uh, behaviour. 
Uh, so yeah, so I did that and my mother passed away a couple of years later and it was that awakening that I had that I didn't want to live a life that wasn't my own and wasn't controlled by me. So uh, there was a lot of dramatic changes that came around. Um, what up. was one uh, most important change? Um, stepping, stepping away from that whole mindset of uh, fulfilling other people's happiness uh, at the cost of my own. Right. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, like I said, I stepped away from a relationship. I took, took my children with me because I had children, young children at the time, and uh, started a new sort of thing. So. Was it difficult? Yeah, it was very difficult. Very. Uh, if I was looking back, you know, this is over possibly getting on for thirty years ago. So, um, uh, I guess if I, I don't really dwell on the past. Mm -hmm. I kind of like literally look at the past and go, oh, that's a life lesson. I will not do that again because mm -hmm. I, I have to move forward. I'm a very move forward person. So if I make a decision to do something and go for it, mm -hmm. I move forward. And if that comes with some kind of consequence, I move forward from that. I don't really dwell on that. Mm -hmm. I sort of are constantly are pushing myself to move forward. Um, so yes, it was very hard. It came with consequences. It came, it came with, uh, uh, you know, sort of emotional um, uh, upsets and stuff. But um, I just, yeah, made myself go forward. Yeah. How was Alva as a teenager? <laughs> Um, like I said, like, didn't really have that as okay. a teenager, uh, sort of, um, I guess I had a very small amount of friends, wasn't really, I didn't really want to, uh, there was popular girls, you know, at school, and then there was kind of like geeky girls, and I was not in, I was not any, in any section or any category, mm -hmm. I had a few, a couple of close friends, um but not really i didn't really enjoy school i didn't like the control of school so the teenage years was kind of i didn't rebel as such mm -hmm. but i also didn't want to fit in i made myself an outcast i purposely made myself an outcast okay. so everything else what everybody was doing the trends or the popular things i was doing the opposite to what everybody was doing i was purposely taking myself out from what was mm -hmm. kind of like i just feel applying the same in I guess I am. Yeah, I guess I am. I don't really take myself away from. Um, I'm not sort of like making myself, you know, sort of like be the one on the outside. I flock to my own kind. So I'm basically, I have a magpie sort of persona. Sort of like, you know, you can see them singular mm -hmm. as a singular bird, and people will, hold, will always go to that, oh, see one magpie at sorrow, they're sorrowful, and it's like, no, no, it doesn't mean that at all. They're very happy right. being their own, in their yes. own company. But you never see magpies with another species of bird. You always will see them with magpies. So I, I, I feel like I'm a very much of a magpie persona. I'm quite comfortable and happy with myself and comfortable with myself. But I will, when I'm with people, I want to be with my own type of person. Mm -hmm. So um, I think that's been a pattern all the way through my life. I have taken myself away from people because it's just like, you know, why? Did you felt, um, I'm pretty sure when, when you took yourself away, uh, you had to say at some point, no. And you had to be uh, quite selective. Uh, was it difficult for you? Did you ever had that guilty feeling? A guilty feeling for for being you for uh, differentiating yourself from others. Um, I don't think it was. I don't think it was guilt. I've kind of gone through quite a few phases of um, being very um, um, there for other people, and I've done that for most of my life. There's some really sensitive times with family that I have put myself. Um, uh, in a position that has been quite um, emotionally and physically draining mm -hmm. and um, and I always had that pattern again it went back to responsibility in early okay. days of responsibility 
So allowing my, myself to take myself away is is beneficial for me. It's 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 what I need. So I I don't feel guilt with mm -hmm. that because I know that that is what I need to, to kind of like yeah. So there's there's no guilt with it. It's something that you just said a very important aspect. Uh, a small detail that sometimes can make the difference. You allow yourself. Yeah. which I'm pretty sure many of us, including myself, uh, I kind of don't allow myself and feel like, oh, I, I shouldn't, you know, if, if I allow myself to be this and this or have my own time, at some point I feel like, am I selfish? Or because again, it's the social pressure that you yeah. have to be in, in a certain way. How do you cope with difficult times? Um, difficult times, so difficult. What is a difficult time? I try to not find a difficult time because, uh, so I can say that I've been through bereavement quite mm -hmm. a few times. Uh, the previous one I had was a couple of years ago. It's my grandmother. She's been there all my life. So when my mother passed, my grandmother was always there. So all my life I've known my grandmother and everything. So um, that was probably one of the most difficult times of my life. And um, how I coped with that was to have a... Um, remind myself that even though that person is no longer I'm no longer to be able to see that person or touch that person or hug that person I is still very much connected with that person so I remember I give myself the allowance to remember the things that I'm still connected genetically I'm connected with that woman you know sort of like um in my heart I'm still connected with that woman so I kind of give myself positive um sort of focuses um so you're, you know to kind of like get over a hard time so like if it's just like the mundane hard time oh i've had a hard time today at work and stuff like that i'll just go and thrash something out in the gym or I'll go out for a long walk and i'll just focus of and that you know but being just privileged of being alive and having my life that mm -hmm. i have and um you know never really looking at anything in a doubtful way or a, a, a prolonged sense of negativity because it it does it doesn't do anything good yeah. for you so. you just mentioned gym and everyone knows that that's a huge part of who you are yeah tell me a little bit about that how uh, how did your interest towards workout words weights uh, started i know that you're doing a lot of sports yeah so I've always done that. So again, it's I think it's a connection as well from my, my parents when I was young because they uh, they got me into martial arts. So I started martial arts when I was very young. Mm -hmm. So I've done Malgar Kung Fu and, and kickboxing. I hold black belts in both. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so when I am strong, I am strong and I know how to I know how to fight correctly. Uh, so I started at the age of 13. Um, I was in a Kung Fu class for three months, at my white belt in that time. And within the following month, I was in a sparring competition where they do not categorize the, uh, the, the, the brand of uh, belt. You will just be put into mm -hmm. a ring with... with I, I, and I was with a grown woman who was a brown belt. And I came away from that competition with winning first prize in the trophy. So I was like... Uh, so I've never really, so my, so I did Laogao Kung Fu, um, I became an instructor, I had my own club, um, along that line I met my husband who I'm married okay. to now, so we've been together 28 years. Wow. Um, so I met him in Kung Fu. How <laughs> impressive. I met him in Kung Fu, we <laughs> both was Kung Fu, we both started club together and uh, so that's where my interest has always come with sport. He's um, he's 10 years older than me. He uh, started bodybuilding at the age of 17 and he's always done it and he's always kept a great physique. Mm. And um, so I've done mostly every type of sport that I can possibly think of sort of thing. So from going from doing uh, martial arts, getting those black belts and then always challenging myself to do something new. So I've done yoga was asked to be a yoga instructor but I was like oh no I want to do something else I've done crossfit I've done yeah I'm now doing what so the weightlifting mm -hmm. came from um doing the lock the lockdown so I was in a crossfit class mm -hmm. to start off with crossfit sort of shut down yeah. we had weights and everything at home 
So I said, oh, let's let's just do some weights. And then it got into serious kind of like weightlifting and I enjoyed it and I didn't go back to CrossFit. Um, and my daughter did a body competition last year, got third place, got invited to the British uh, um, bodybuilding competition, which then gave me incentive to see, oh, how far can I push my body mm. into doing this thing? So a long history of kind of like lots of different physical activity uh, to this day. And it's a thing that when someone says, oh, but your age and everything else, I I am quite oblivious and I kind of ignore and I'm quite, I'm one of these people who will shut down anybody, anybody who's given me an excuse why I can't yeah. achieve something. Don't give me excuses to why I can't achieve something. Give me in, a solution. In, in a way, I, I totally resonate because it, in the way that I function is if someone will tell me no, we'll be like, okay, watch me. I, yeah. Even though I wasn't intending to do that, now I want to do that yeah. just because you told yeah. me no. There's, there's some kind of like, there's some defiance mm -hmm. in it. And I think I've always had a defiance because I'm thinking from early, early childhood to that whole um not ever being told no but kind of feeling that I was in something in a way that I was I was kind of like almost my fate was going to be mapped out for me but I don't believe that I cannot change that at any given time mm -hmm. I don't think you if you're in a situation that you have to stick there I think you a life is a, like a corridor right. with multiple opportunities to kind of go out of that corridor at any given time you choose you, the door. yeah you go in the door if you don't you can spend some time in there if you don't like it mm -hmm opt out and try another door for people who put themselves in a situation and continue to be in that situation i don't understand why how important do you think is the mindset the mindset of being in, in general is, in in someone's life in uh, how important was it in your case a uh, very important i think like um having a positive I am going to achieve this mindset. Um, I think if I didn't, I, I don't think if I had that, I wouldn't, there would have been many a times where I would have opted out for like just hanging back and probably having a totally different life into what I have now. I've always known that somewhere in my pit of my stomach that I had to have a certain incentive to get where I am because no one's going to provide that for me. I want that, so mm -hmm. therefore I have to do that for myself. So that's very much the driven mindset, even like in the work thing, when you know, when you go, oh, well, I will do this for you. And you know, it's like, yes, I could wait, and I could wait, and I could wait. But if I want this, mm -hmm. then I'm going to go drive forward and I'm going to get it. So my, my mindset was very much like set at the onset of I want to change my life from where I was to where I am and um, and, and today it's still it's still the same and I think that reflects also in my children because my children have gone on to have the same mindset and you know it's like I literally will say you know what you go for you strive for you know yeah. and um, so that was yeah we're all the same in the family we just kind of have that um, tell me, how did you start with the, or how did you discover BDSM? Um, I think, again, that is like a pit of a stomach feeling that you have from going from playing as, as a kid okay. to the games that you play. So with, I, I was very much in a, in a family where I had, like I said, a lot of siblings. But so I had a lot of cousins and everything else. It's very and it's very masculine. Was competitivity. Yeah, masculine. yeah. It wasn't like there was a lot of boys, you know. So it was a lot of kind of rough play mm. and tumble and stuff like that. So you kind of like literally had to uphold yourself to kind of like get involved in the games. But some of them games were like, oh, you know, we'll play this game and tie you up and put you in the cupboard right. and stuff like that not me but mm -hmm. me doing it to the boys and stuff you know sort of like so and i can have very like um vivid memories of kind of being a child and kind of having dolls and 
um, I had I had the I had the pure uh, um, so I didn't have a Barbie but I had the Cindy because she was the okay. pure <laughs> she was the pure uh, the you know the dolls it's like oh bad girls had Barbies and like good girls had Cindy you know it's like yeah you have the home wrecker when I have the home maker sort of thing and I very much remember sort of like um, basically undressing that and putting electrical tape to make her a nice shiny Whoa. tight 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 Whoa. dress. You know, and, and having my, <laughs> my, my brother's action man toy and doing, you're tying him up and stuff. So I can have, I still have vivid memories mm. from that. So how I, I guess how I progressed when I got sort of like younger and understand sexuality and fetishes and stuff like that. And, you know, uh, it was like, uh, always like having a little bit of experiment of tying up and stuff. And I can remember just having a go, I was just like, oh. I'm bored, can you untie me? I knew, <laughs> I knew it wasn't the role that I was right. going to enjoy. So, uh, and Do you remember your, uh, your first uh, play being aware of your dominant side? What was it? And if it's possible, with whom? Uh, so, I guess that was with uh, my, my first husband, I guess. And that would have been like a tie-up bondage situation um, but I, I think even before that though I had an understanding of sort of like a sexual kind of dominant presence mm -hmm. that I had it's almost you would say to go and do something and you would have someone go and do do it sort of thing and you wasn't saying please or thank you or anything else like you were just like oh go and get me this and they would go it, off it, and, and it do it natural. so it was yeah. a natural thing so um before even the bdsm part of it it was that just that whole natural energy that i guess i had mm -hmm. that it was just and you didn't really think of it sort of thing you didn't think of there. it as a thing yeah. you know and I guess when the whole relationship thing part of it came in and like, you know, um, the sexual side of things, it was just like anything that was phenomenal, I was just like bored. I was just, oh gosh, this is what you do for the like, the, Did the you ever way. had any vanilla relationships? <laughs> yes, I did. Yeah. Okay, how, how was that? How, <laughs> so no, that's the one that, ended, 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 ended. that, did, uh, that didn't end. So boyfriends at school, bo boyfriends as teenagers, I didn't really, wasn't really interested in mm -hmm. boys. I thought they was horrid and they just, you know, there was this school book. And I thought, there's a whole wide world of discovery out there. Why would I be just hanging around with a boy right. from school and stuff? So I wasn't really that interested. Wasn't really, I had a few vanilla relationships and then I was married and that was just like, oh gosh, this is what, this is what it is. Mm -hmm. This is what it's going to be. And I always felt that I wasn't, I wasn't myself and somehow I was being suppressed somehow and I couldn't quite work it out what mm -hmm. that was. Um, I think until I left that relationship and then felt that I could be me and explore me more. And I think one of the first exploitations I had of that was when I was with my partner, who I'm with now. I was like, oh, I really wanted to go and do something for a very and long time. And what age was that? Oh, gosh, it wasn't until I was 25. Okay. So it was a long, it was a it, long it period. It took you a while. Yeah, it took me a long time. So, but that was, that was my period of becoming free. Mm -hmm. You know, I was that I went from a child to a wife to having children to kind of like then having finding life mm -hmm. and finding me so my path of discovery even though i felt it all the time i wasn't it was almost like i was suppressed to kind of right. explore that until that period of time where i felt i was in a place of a time and with the right person to be able to uh, mm -hmm. to be myself so when i've always felt that i could be myself there was a the right. first part of my life, it was like I was playing a role to keep other people mm -hmm. happy. Like I said, a form of responsibility. You you you're made to feel yeah. responsible. In in when you're made to feel responsible, you also kind of like take on the characteristic that is kind of oh you're a people pleaser. We need to keep people happy. Right. And this is the way of keeping right. people happy, because you know. So yeah, it took, it took until that point to like say oh, okay, I've, I've always known about this. I've always known about mm -hmm. it, but not been you, able you feel to this discuss it. You yes, know. yes. So you know, I thought, oh yeah, let's go and do this. So, um, so I went to a very early torch garden, 
and um, literally when I went in, I was just like, oh my god, this is this feels it feels like I'm home. It feels like mm-hmm. I've landed somewhere, and um, basically a month later, I was a dominatrix. Wow! <laughs> and since then, you just explore yourself. It was a continuous exploration. Yeah, it was just like a. It was like it was growing. It mm-hmm. was a growth. Because it was not about really exploring myself as well. It was allowing myself to grow and not be contained. Because mm. I think that's where I was at that point in life, the beginning of my right. life. I was contained. I was just uh, waiting for the lid to come off <laughs> the jar and be allowed to grow yeah. rather than being just contained in this, what I thought was going to be my life. Sort of thing, so. Tell me how, if you remember, how was your first meeting with your partner? My first you still meet, remember the first day, the first time that you saw it was in Kung Fu mm-hmm. class. So we was fighting. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So, so it, it wasn't romantic. It wasn't oh, like, okay. anything like. It I was, was hoping. Like, yeah. It was, it was, but I get. Well, I guess it was. It was a bit of a romance, a world, uh, a, a, a romantic thing in the end. Um, basically, though, it's it's going to sound really shallow. I'm going to sound shallow now. Because I was with my first husband, I basically did cheat on my first husband to be with the partner that I'm with now. So people judge that by how I, I, I think you. I think it, it took uh, a lot of courage for you to move on and to end a, a relationship uh, that it didn't fulfill you and yeah. go to something that is it, it felt right for you yeah and unfortunately uh now at times it happens a lot of uh women especially remain in the in a relationship without actually feeling complete without feeling happy yeah. just for the sake of it because yeah. it's like the, the social pressure that you have to um how was it in your case, did you had any? Did you felt any st- social pressure when when you had to when you decide this is the man that I'm gonna? I don't continue? think it was social. I don't think it was social pressure. Um, I didn't feel that it's like um oh you know you know what my neighbours think or anything mm-hmm. else like that. That wasn't it. Wasn't social pressure. It was. I guess it was. Um, it was just. Pressure from uh, the emotional connection with kind of like members of family. So, um, my father was very much like, you know, you know marriage is for life, basically, mm-hmm. still old school values and old school views. Right. Um, and didn't have my mother around for that. But I went to my grandmother, and my grandmother, she was very much what makes you happy. She said, You have you only can decide what makes you happy. So she was very much an icon in my life because mm-hmm. she wasn't, you know, given the age of her, which is double of mine, mm-hmm. you know, she was very much, you know, you you have to be you, you do you. You know, and that very first time when I did the, the breakup, I still wasn't sure if I'd done the right thing. So I had that guilt. You never know. No, you, I had, I had okay. that guilt and I, I, I went back, you know, and then... The moment I went back, I realised that I was only going back to make somebody else happy, and I was was unhappy. So for me, it wasn't about social pressure. It was just, again, it was just a little bit of, I'm making someone else unhappy. Mm -hmm. And I, I was at that point thinking, well, I'm ready to sacrifice my own happiness to make someone else happy, but realised that that wasn't going to be sustainable, and that I had to... Sometimes be happy. It's difficult, but some decisions have to be taken. Yeah. So my first meeting with my with my, with my husband here, I've been with twenty eight years now. So we say that we are soul we are soul partners. That we are not only just married, but we are friends. We are kind of like you know, we was on a friend level for some time before we sort of like was um, you know see, seeing each other in 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 a different way. We would sit and we talk and we would just like share share experiences and share what he was going through at the time and stuff. What, was he into BDSM also? No. Okay, yeah. so he was one either. Yeah. How, uh, did you introduce him or was it something that he kind of picked up along? Or no, or so basically I was, we uh, was married for, uh, for a bit of time 
and um, I, like I said, mm. I was I was growing in myself. The the lid of the jar. I was very comfortable with him and who he was, and to be open and honest all all the time with him. I didn't feel that I had to play a different role in order to kind of maintain his acceptance mm. of me or anything else right. like that. You know, when we get in relationships, mm. we feel that we have to change it, ourselves. It's a period where yeah. I have to... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because you want, to be, you want to be accepted right. and right. you want to be liked by that person and loved by that person. So we somewhat change to be in a relationship. And um, I, I felt that I didn't have to do that, that I could be me and I didn't have to play anything, didn't mm. have to be accepted by right. him. So um, I think after a period of time when I still like was growing and growing, I was just like, this is the person who I said, look, you know, I've had this for a very long time and I need to kind of go and find mm -hmm. it and explore it. And, and he's very, very supportive and he came with me and he's like, you know, he's a very chivalrous man. So he's very gentleman-like. He does all the gentleman thing. Uh, you know, he's not my submissive, but he will kind of make sure that he's running around for mm. me doing the you things for me. Issues. So yeah, so yeah, I don't have to. What do you think, what would be your advice for the uh, newbies, and especially the ones that are within a relationship and they, they want to, first of all, make the relationship uh, work within this dynamic, and um, to start this road of um, BDSM road and this to be well, I've just had a experience with a long term submissive that I had under me for a good a good ten years. I've had him and known him, and uh, at, at early well mid last year, I had the phone call and he said, "Oh, this just I've met this wonderful." Woman and stuff, mm -hmm. and I think I really like her very much and stuff. And I was, it's really good, you know. I'm really, really pleased. And then he said, "Oh, she's gone from friend to kind of like we're doing, you know." And he said, "I want you to meet her." And I said, "Excuse me." And he's like, "Because I have literally gone to her. I've took it, taken your words because I have, you know, I've, I've, what I've said is lead a genuine life. Right. If you meet someone and you want to form a strong connection with someone." and a true connection and a genuine connection mm -hmm. do not be honest. afraid right. do not be afraid of showing your true self you know as it can go two ways you right. know there's but, always but, but at least but at least if it goes mm -hmm. that way you know that you shouldn't have been with that person right yeah right. so it's from the very start so you're going to it, know you will be disappointed but then you'll move yeah. on because yeah. you know this that's not going to be the right one and it could end up in like a year two years three totally. years like, yeah totally. so um so yeah i was really i was really um happy for them to be part of each other and exploring mm -hmm. bdsm together because they started the relationship honest to right. each other even to the point that we went out all together, we spoke, I spoke to her, she sort of was talking to me about my relationship that I had with him as a submissive mm -hmm. and everything. How, how, do you see, how do you see your submissives? How, how are they? For me, all my submissives are like my babies <laughs> and, or, or n n my properties, but in a way I'm very protective and very mummy-like and I want them to be like, even though I'm harsh and yeah, whatever, yeah. You know, well, it is. You 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 form an emotional connection, you know. So you kind of like you've got someone who comes to you with their full trust mm -hmm. to do the things that we're able and capable and, and we do to mm -hmm. them, you know. Um, so that a true submissive will, uh, you know, will give their you know t total power exchange mm -hmm. and stuff for us to do that. So if someone is giving you. Your, their whole being, their whole in a, trust. In a consensual yeah, way. In a, yeah, in a, con in a consensual way. If they're, if they're doing that, then yes, you become very emotionally attached. You form this, you form a, a relationship because mm -hmm. it is a relationship. So you do feel protected. So with that person meeting this person, it was like, you know, not only was I was like, I was, I was heartfelt to feel that he was able to be able to say to this, to his, his new girlfriend that he he had someone he had this person in his life that was very important to mm -hmm. him so he felt the need to express the importance right. and why i was just like 
Were you happy for him? I was very him? happy. Yeah, I was very happy. And she went, I think when she first met, she was a bit cautious of me on how I was going to be like taking her sub. And I said, oh, no, no, this is the best. This is the best news that I could receive that he's like found someone and you've been totally honest and open and you're exploring together yeah. and you're sharing things together. I said, because what I can give is only a certain mm -hmm. amount. I can't give the whole of what someone right. is searching for. Right. I can only give this amount and this right. is my boundary and this is what I can give. I said, but you can fill in, you can fill in much of a bigger mm -hmm. gap and you can do it in a genuine and honest way. So talking about boundaries, you just mentioned from my perspective, I think it's a very, very important aspect. How important are boundaries in any dynamic, in any interaction, in, in life in general, from your so again, it's down to good communication. I think boundaries always get blurred if, like, communicate if there's a communication break breakdown. Um, so, and I think sometimes you do have to go re back and readjust mm -hmm. boundaries because boundaries are always changing because dynamics change, chemistry right. changes, and everything. And familiarity kind of can bring some kind of like uh, like dissolution of where that boundary is. So I think if it's like something, you know, you always have to sort of like not move boundaries, but have them kind of like fluid, mm -hmm. you know, not to disfavor you, but to kind of like keep it like, okay, because right. sometimes they just get lost a little bit in translation. Mm -hmm. And if the communication is not well, well, it can be misread, right. you know, on both sides, there can be a misread conception of what the boundary is. So I think it's important always in whatever uh, relationship mm -hmm. you're in, whether you're in that's a relationship with children, whether that's a relationship with your partner, you know, it's like to identify yourself from where you don't want to be emotionally and physically. Right. I think it's important to always kind of reinforce your, your boundaries, but kind of allow yourself to kind of have them be so slightly fluid. Like yeah, time, like, so like not, not a brick wall. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. something that is fluid, which can change with your dynamics and with your chemistry, depending on what relationship. Because you just mentioned, sorry, ah, okay. because you just mentioned uh, kids, how difficult or not difficult it is to be a mother and a professional dominatrix. How is that going on? Uh, so, my children are all grown up, so my, my kids are yeah grown humans now so like so when uh they was younger um and i was still working as a matrix uh they're very much in their school hours i was working but i never kept it a hidden thing so i didn't uh i tried so to they knew all the time. yeah so i explained it in a very simplified way mm -hmm. of how you can explain it to children age appropriate sort <laughs> of thing you know that this is what i did i've al always been out with who I am and what I do uh, for the fact that I feel that it's best to have. At the time, I guess when my eldest son was around about 11 and at that age where technology was there and you could easily pull something up from the internet, I wanted him to know from me mm -hmm. what it was that I was doing, not shown on the screen right. of what it was that I was doing. I, I feel that if, um, if people make something shameful, then we carry shame. If mm. we if we embrace it and own it, yeah. then there's this there's no shame. Right. It it's you make it normal, you make it part of who, who you are and what it is. Yeah. So yeah, so the more normalized you can make the situation, the more sort of like less shame or you know, whatever other people in society may come mm -hmm. about it. Right. You know, if you're sometimes being, society can be so so mean yeah. and ruthless. Yeah, they can, they can. So it's just so so bringing up kids um, as a dominatrix, I didn't find it a, I didn't find it um, traumatic or dramatic or hard or anything. I just made it normal, mm -hmm. and it was a no, it was just normal. It was just normal in the house. You know that I I grown up as kind of like as being a bit of a goth being a bit of an alternative dresser so they all see me always see me as an alternative and right. stuff anyway so that whole thing of kind of oh now i'm going to a fetish club mm. or i'm now a dominatrix wasn't really much of a, a shock thing my, my children have had had a very diverse upbringing mm. with different things as well so uh, they have really been exposed to diversity from quite young ages so so that helped them to understand yeah, and yeah. 
be easier for you to explain uh, your job and also yeah. your lifestyle because yeah. you are yeah. a lifestyle also. Yeah. Yeah. Um, if you if you would like to well, if someone would think about you, what would it be? Uh, what would you like to be associated with? Uh, a word, uh, an activity. What like when someone is saying I love home medicine to be associated um, with? Uh, I guess just uh, be very very accepting of whoever they are. I I think that's where I've always wanted to be. It's like I didn't want to ever be over from those. Oh gosh, she's all right. Cow something like that you know like I said I always go out to be a genuine person and I, I I don't get involved with anyone who's like talking about this person or have a view on something I'm just like neutral I'm mm -hmm. like Switzerland <laughs> you, know, it's just okay. like, you know I just like I just don't, I just don't, I like to be the person who's like okay you know just like really neutral and really accepting and non-judgmental non so I, I guess it's my uh, just being a genuine person Right. That's why I probably wouldn't when it's like over from medicine, it's like, oh, yeah, she's a really genuine, down to earth person, you know. So, I, so I, I guess that's what I want to That's the one of the things that I associate you with, I personally associate you with. And um, each time I'm in your presence, I feel in a way safe, if it makes it, and feel comfortable to be myself. Mm. Now, uh, talking about being comfortable to, to be myself, what would you, it be your advice for women out there? For women in for, general? For just women in yes. general. Okay, so um, I would like to express that literally, um, you know, uh, no matter what situation that you are in, uh, if it's in a complicated one, if it's in a happy one, whatever, like I said before, it's like really easy to walk a path and walk a path for someone else. Um, but the path can always kind of go off in different directions and don't ever think that you do not have an option to change yeah. your circumstances. Regardless of yeah, how your situation, it can be really, really difficult and really, really could tear, tear the innards out of mm. you. Believe me, I have been in some situations where I've kind of felt that it's going to be, um, you know, break, I'm going to break. Um, but I've kind of pushed through that and I've got to the other side and I'm stronger. Right. So some things that break you do actually mm -hmm. make you make stronger. stronger. Okay. So I think that any woman out there who's considering a change for themselves, be the change for yourself. Mm -hmm. Don't be a change for anybody else. Mm. Like, well, some people do look at me and go, oh, you've gone through some a lot of changes from way back when you first started. Yes, I have, because I've grown. I've had that lid of the job mm. open, and I've grown, and I've allowed it. part of your development. I've, I've, I've allowed it for myself. Mm. I don't do it for anybody else. I don't do it to look like anybody else or do it to look for that person. I do you. it for myself. Okay. And that's what all women should do, is do when you make a decision, when you make a change, when you're thinking about making a change, do it. Don't get stuck in that mm -hmm. moment thinking, oh, I'll do it next It can week. be scary sometimes. Yes, but it's very, very, step. very scary. But the first step is the most important right. because that one step is the change. Right. Yeah. So um, what, in three words, how would you describe yourself? Only three words. <laughs> I know it's difficult, isn't it? Um, yeah, it is. It's um, um, safe, uh, accepting, um, and uh, unjudgmental. Have you ever been uh, felt judged? I all the time. How do you handle that? Uh, by not being judgmental. Right. So setting an example. I, yes, I read. It's a bit, a bit of reverse psychology. So if someone's judging me, I would pay them a compliment rather than kind of feel that I need to be. So, so. Wow, this is so powerful. I want to end up with this conclusion. 
when because I'm pretty sure uh, our viewers uh, at some point they felt to judge um, by society in general and just take this as a lesson don't be judgmental no never pay, a pay back as a compliment yeah. so I want to thank you very much it was an honor and I was amazed Actually, I was expecting you to be in, in this way, but I didn't know so many details and there are so many layers about yourself and you indeed are a very per beautiful person, uh, not only outside, but inside also. So thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you so much. And thank you also for viewing um, this episode. Also, where can people find you? Oh, so literally Google Ava von Mason, mm. and I've been about for a very long time. So Google's there, but it's, a, it's mostly Ava von Mason on most platforms. Right. So social. What media. is your official website? So, so it's, it's my official, official web. Yeah, so my official website is avavonmedicine.com. So that is the official website. So now you see. Uh, don't get tricked by all the scammers because I know that you have a huge issue with, <laughs> with this. Uh, you heard the official website, you can find all the information about the gorgeous uh, Ava Von Medicine and I see you next uh, to um, my next episode on Conversation Over Coffee. So thank you, thank you. Don't forget to subscribe by the way. <laughs> Bye now. Subscribe, do that. <laughs>